coming up. We got 300 nominations, but only one airport can be deemed the most challenging. And how is the Skycatcher working out as a trainer? We find out. Plus, what does the FCC have to say to the FAA about iPads in the airplane? And we fly the newest LSA to land on our shores. The OPA Live this week begins right now. Hello and welcome to AOPA Live This Week. I'm Warren Morningstar. Tom Haynes is on assignment. Well, Flight Design's latest entry in the light sport aircraft market sips fuel and offers updates, including a state-of-the-art engine. AOPA Live reporter Jim Moore was among the first U.S. journalists to fly this new arrival. Here's his exclusive report. This is one of the first CTLSI aircraft to arrive in the United States, and Flight Design USA President Tom Beghini met me at Flight Design US headquarters in Woodstock, Connecticut to show me the new model. What's the biggest difference between this and the, the previous model? Well, of course, the Rotax 912 IS fuel-injected engine, and Flight Design made a special series to take advantage of the 912 IS and there were some changes to the fuel system. The new fuel selector switch is the most noticeable change. And at the same time, we refreshed some of the avionics choices and uh, did make it a new plane. The optional 10-inch Dynon Skyview SV EMS electronic flight information system displays are now fully integrated with the autopilot, and a Garmin 796 centers this upgraded panel. So this, this stays as your moving map and or synthetic yeah. vision pretty much throughout the flight? Well, this is also synthetic vision here. Okay. Both. And then you have backup. If this fails, it automatically comes up on here. And actually, if the ADA HARS fails on that one, this switches over to the other ADA HARS and shows it right there. Okay. It's extremely redundant system. The fuel-injected Rotax responds smoothly and gets us off the ground quickly. The published takeoff roll with 15 degrees of flaps is just over 800 feet. And on this chilly December afternoon, 465 feet above sea level, we probably beat that. Light sport aircraft are required to deliver low stall speeds, and the all-composite airframe handles very well in slow flight. Power off stalls were very docile, and while I was still getting used to the feel of the flight controls, rudder pressure felt a little stiff, there was no sign of bad behavior with power on stalls either. Maybe a slight wing drop, but I blame my lazy feet for that. We used the two-axis autopilot, now fully integrated with the EFIS, to take us to Danielson Airport to try a few landings, burning very little fuel. Flight design test pilots have logged 115 knots true at 4,500 feet, burning four gallons per hour. For this LSA rookie, adjusting to a different sight picture was the biggest challenge on landing. The forward visibility is excellent, but you can't see the nose from the pilot's seat, and the 49-inch wide cabin puts you a little bit farther from the center line than some pilots might be used to. People have a hard time getting the nose straight on landing. Flight design continues to include transition training in the price, which ranges from $152,500 to about $170,000 for the fuel-injected models, depending on options. On the third trip around the pattern, I managed to dial it in. We headed back to Woodstock to take a closer look inside the aircraft, and I noticed another feature. It's pretty quiet. The fuel-injected Rotax is the latest innovation in an aircraft that has made several. Flight design has really pushed the envelope for technology whenever it's been available. You know, we were the first to employ the dual Dynon system. You know, very early on we were embedding uh, the Garmin 496 and 696 into the plane for the primary navigation. And we were one of the first LSAs to have autopilots and glass cockpits. And then, you know, the airframe is advanced carbon fiber. And so it's got a lot of technology. You'll find a lot of that technology under the cowling. In Woodstock, I'm Jim Moore, AOPA Live. The new Rotax 912 IS engine can run on just about any combination of 100 low lead or auto gas, including auto fuel with ethanol. Flight Design is celebrating 25 years of the CT Series aircraft, offering special pricing, paint, and other options through December 31. You can read more about the CTLSI on AOPA.org. Well, kit airplane manufacturer Epic Aircraft is looking to expand its facilities in Bend, Oregon. The company is negotiating to buy the vacant building where Cessna used to build the Columbia. 
Epic wants to start building a certificated turboprop single in addition to the experimental LT model. Now, some years ago, the company announced the Dynasty, which was scheduled to become the certificated follow-on to the kit-built plane. But back in Wichita, Hawker Beechcraft got the news that a federal court has approved its bankruptcy plan. Uh, now the creditors have to agree. If all goes to plan, the company will come out of the other side as the Beechcraft Corporation, building the Bonanza, Baron, King Air, and some military models. Uh, the jets are no more. Well, the White House is asking Congress for some $30 million for the FAA. That's to help the agency recover from Superstorm Sandy damage, including repairs to control tower roofs, approach lighting systems, and nav aids. Well, what kind of weather worries you the most as a pilot? For many, including me, it's icing. During these uh, winter months, it's frequently forecast, but not so frequently found. So how do you make the go, no-go decision? I asked our own safety expert, Bruce Landsberg, about some of his icing experiences and what things the AOPA Air Safety Institute has to help you. Uh, I was flying in a Bonanza and was coming out of North Carolina with a couple people on board the aircraft. And uh, there was no indication that there was going to be ice. We got airborne and uh, there came an announcement uh, uh, broadcast over the frequency that uh, there had been some uh, freezing rain reported. Well, that immediately got my attention because freezing rain, or in today's terminology, it's supercooled liquid droplets, or SLD is, is the uh, abbreviation. And that immediately got my attention because that can build up very, very quickly. Uh, it's very difficult to get rid of, even in a booted aircraft. And sure enough, we got into this, I don't want to say that it was quite rain, but it was a freezing mist, and we were IMC. Well, I called the controller immediately and said, uh, we'd like to uh, get a climb, and so forth. The controller said, okay, fine, and uh, we climbed uh, about uh, 2,000 feet. But Landsberg I, says climbing isn't always the best option. One of the things about climbing, though, and uh, uh, I've learned this also from experience, is that oftentimes you'll be in an, a layer and you start to get icing, and you can look up and maybe you can just see just up at the, out of the top of the windscreen that if you could climb just another thousand feet or so you could get out of this. Well what happens is that the tops are where the absolute worst icing conditions are and if you've waited a bit too long and your climb capability is already degraded you may not be able to climb out of the tops because that's where all of the moisture is being held aloft by the lifting in the clouds and you'll get right up to the top there and then you've got no more climb left and now you're worse off than what you were before. You can learn about different icing scenarios and how to deal with them in the Air Safety Institute's online course, Do the Right Thing. Other online resources? Real pilot story. Ambushed by ice, Ambushed yes. Ambushed by ice, a nice case study. That involved, as, as interestingly enough, an air traffic controller who uh, really did sort of understand it. He was flying a uh, Cessna 182, which we think of as a big brawny airplane and, and pretty capable of dealing with this. And you'd be amazed at how uh, the equipment can be overcome by Mother Nature. What tools do you personally use to get a check on, on ice and determine whether or not you're going to make the flight? Oh, good question. Um, a number of different things. Uh, first off, I'll, I'll start off as usual with the general weather pattern. Uh, what's the temperature? What's the temperature aloft? Uh, do I have clouds? Um, obviously, you will not get icing if you don't have clouds. Now, they talk about icing and clouds and precipitation. If it's snow and you are beneath the, the cloud, you will not be iced up. However, freezing rain, you can be outside the cloud and the rain is falling through, that can be, uh, that can be a huge problem. But if you're gonna be flying in the clouds, then you have to understand the temperature. And then I'm gonna start to figure out, okay, how thick is the cloud layer? If it's only a couple thousand feet thick and it's not too high, then I may have the capability of topping it. Well, the Weather Service has on the digital site, on the ADDS site, a, a weather or an icing forecasting model. Right, the uh, uh, SIP product, uh, CIP they call it, or supplemental icing, uh, it's all helpful. 
all of that uh, allows us to get a little more granular in terms of altitude and specifics, and it's probably a bit more detailed than what you're going to get with uh, uh, the air mats, which tend to be by nature much broader. Uh, when I go to look at this, I'll start with the air mats, then I'll go to the uh, SIP product and, and take a look. This is all under the icing tabs on ads, and then I'm going to go look at PIREPS and see, okay, what have we got there? Is anybody actually reporting uh, some of this? And so, you can find all of the Air Safety Institute's courses and other safety resources by clicking on the Air Safety Institute tab on AOPA.org. Now, all of the courses and resources Bruce mentioned are free to all pilots thanks to the AOPA Foundation. If you'd like to help the Foundation help your fellow pilots, you might consider sending AOPA Foundation holiday cards. There are some 26 different aviation scenes to choose from. You can get the cards personalized, and the proceeds go to the AOPA Foundation. You can order at holidaycardcenter.org slash AOPA. Well, coming up after the break, what's the most challenging airport in the country? And a bit later, how good a trainer is the Cessna Skycatcher? You're watching AOPA Live this week. Flight following didn't call out an opposing plane. I saw it on the screen. He turned right and the other plane just pretty much flew right on by. It, it's your life, you only get one shot at this. Welcome back. You're watching AOPA Live this week. As we told you at the top of the show, Tom Haynes is on assignment this week in Wichita. He's working on stories on some interesting new technology and he was a participant in the Wichita Aero Club's on-air summit. The roundtable this year featured a panel of the industry's leading media representatives talking about the biggest stories of 2012 and what they expect to be the headline issues of 2013. Haynes caught up with a few of his aviation media counterparts at the event. Uh, I think a significant development in 2012 for corporate aviation, oddly enough, is that uh, the election was completed and that decision has been made. Whether you're for it or against it, at least you have stability or a level of stability for the next four years. Corporate aviation, business aviation relies so much on the health and, and forecast of their respective companies that, and, and in, in the corporate world, what you don't, you can't stand is the unknown. In propulsion, we're gonna be having pistons for a long time. Pistons have been under your hood in a car for decades and decades, and still, even with all of the resources available to the auto industry, the finest, highest performing cars still have piston engines, and I believe that's what general aviation will have for decades to come. Rapidly growing area is autonomous flight, and of course it can be the UAV, the drone, that uh, it flies itself, never it was intended to have a pilot. But now, all sorts of um, agencies and industries are looking at traditional airplanes being flown without a pilot for a variety of reasons. While some aero clubs have been around for many decades, surprisingly, the air capital of the world just started its club in December of 2008. AOPA is a founding member of the Wichita Aero Club. Now here's something that makes so much sense, it's hard to believe it's coming from the feds. The FCC, that's the Federal Communications Commission, is asking the FAA to allow airline passengers to use iPads, e-readers, and other electronic devices during takeoff and landing. FCC Chairman Julius Jankowski told the FAA the devices help people stay connected and informed and make businesses more productive. Uh, the FAA is already reviewing its policies on in-flight use of electronic devices. You know, if iPads are okay for pilots, you'd think they'd be okay for passengers, too. For more than 50 years, some of the world's best aviation photography has graced the cover and pages of AOPA Pilot magazine. In recent years, two of the artists behind the lens have been Mike Pfizer and Chris Rose. Now some of their art can grace your walls. We've got a lot of images in our collection. Right now, I think AOPA has about uh, 250,000 individual images in our collection. So there's obviously a lot of images to look through. Looked at images that were, um, that were some of our favorites based on some, some, of the great, some of the great trips that we've taken and some of the great aircraft that we've worked with. Probably one of my favorite images is um, we did a shoot uh, a couple of years ago where um, uh, AOPA senior editor Dave Hirschman and I took a, uh, a WACO across the country. We flew it from Frederick, Maryland all the way to California and one of our stops along the way 
was the canyon lands in Utah. And when that morning light came up over the, uh, uh, came over the edge of the canyon and lit up that airplane and then, of course, lit up the, the canyon, it was just, it was pretty magical. It was, uh, it was really a, a very interesting shoot. And all of us are really satisfied with the, the quality level. They look, they look great. Uh, the framing job is, is extremely professional and, and they make great Christmas presents. Just go to the Publications tab on AOPA.org and select AOPA Photo Gallery Store to order your prints. They make great holiday gifts. Well, we asked and you answered, what's the most challenging airport in the United States? AOPA members nominated airports in 35 states. Al Marsh tries his hand at the one deemed the toughest. Linwood Springs, Colorado, a friendly airport at 5,900 feet with a dog. So why did AOPA members call it the most challenging airport in America? An aerial view shows why. It's at the bottom of a canyon. It even has a hill where you need to turn base, and a canyon wall where you turn final. Night landings are out. It's a one-way runway, so you're going out the same way you came in, unless the tailwind would be too strong, as it was the day we were there. Nearby Aspen, which was voted second most challenging, is also a one-way airport. Most aircraft land with a tailwind. Jet pilots say passengers want to leave on hot afternoons, but find out about density altitude here at 7,800 feet. This is a 70 degree day and the takeoff looks anemic. Slower aircraft can maneuver among the hills around Aspen, so we were able to hold over the city until opposing traffic landed. This is Al Marsh, AOPA Live. You can read much more about the airport and the decision to name it the most challenging in the January edition of AOPA Pilot Magazine, available next week on your tablet if uh, you subscribe to our digital edition. Well, when we come back, it's supposed to be the replacement for the venerable 152. So, how's it working out? It's been called the most sophisticated single-engine airplane ever, but to the people whose loved ones are alive today, it's called a lifesaver. The Cirrus Airframe Parachute System, only from Cirrus Aircraft. Welcome back. You could call them beta testers of sorts. The Michigan Flyers are a flying club. About a year ago, they became one of the first clubs to begin operating a Cessna 162, otherwise known as the Skycatcher. Twelve months in, they sat down with our cameras and talked about how it's all working out. Here's more from AOPA senior photographer Mike Pfizer. Michigan Flyers is a flying club. It was originally formed as a student organization uh, in 1969 for the University of Michigan. The, the club's been around in one form or another for about 100 years. You know, we have evidence that the Wright, Mo Wright brothers actually donated a, uh, uh, a motor to the, uh, to the club. I think it was in 1914. You guys, overwhelming support. Uh, everybody wanted to have the airplane in the fleet. They thought it would be a lot of fun. Uh, uh, from a training perspective, the instructors were, were interested in it, but the members were, they just were excited about having something new on the, on the line and, uh, you know, a, a really a, an interesting per little personal airplane, so. The Skycatcher has a great performance for a small, light airplane. It climbs well. It performs well in the air. The airspeed rivals the airspeed of the 172. Uh, the maneuvers feel just the same in the air as they do in any other high-wing airplane, so it's very easy for a student to transition. The difficulty is in taxiing, handling the airplane in a strong crosswind. It's more comfortable to ride in than a Cessna 152. For anyone who's flown a 152, this aircraft is slightly wider. Even though it's a smaller plane, it's slightly wider, so you have a little more shoulder room. Uh, it's easier to get in and out of. It has uh, gull doors, so um, you can get inside the aircraft more easily and get out. So one of the things we do worry about with the Skycatcher is it is a, a lighter weight aircraft. So when we see uh, new students and new members uh, working with the plane, it's, it's something that we're careful to. Uh, we have a specific published document of handling notes that we uh, picked up from Cessna while we were out there. And, you know, it even includes things like how to handle the rudder, whereas on a normal plane you kind of can push it and, and waggle it back and forth. And with the uh, Skycatcher you use a hand over the spar. And there's some things like that that we just like to be uh, 
careful of. And it's, uh, you know, as a partial owner in the airplane, which all of us members are, it's uh, just uh, something we're a little more conscious of with this aircraft than some of the others. We've got plane number 82, and, and you know, it's a new product, and uh, it's, uh, we, we're kind of a beta site, I guess. We're one of the many. You know, specifically, uh, there's, a, there's a problem. Doors can come open in flight. When that happens, it uh, damages the door. It's about $8,000 to repair it. So Cessna introduced a secondary latch for the forward latch. Now, if the rear latch comes undone, there's a really a pretty benign problem. It's not an issue. But the front latch comes done, undone, that door folds open and out of the way. We've seen that happen twice. The pitot tube's kind of an interesting problem, but we, we've, we solved it. We've got a bright, brightly colored, uh, you know, neon yellow pitot tube cover right now. But the thing, uh, it's very small. It's in a, an unprotected portion of the, of the wing, and uh, uh, it's just at the level when you duck under the wing to, uh, as part of pre-flight, you're gonna, there's a good chance you catch it on your forehead. So, you know, the downside of, of a light sport, I mean, they are sensitive to winds. We've got a wind limitation for ground handling of 22 knots. When the surface winds are high, uh, you know, we're not flying the airplane. And, uh, you know, about half the time when we're not flying the Skycatcher, we are able to fly the 152s and the 172. You know, the one limitation we're running into is if a, if a student get through his training in that airplane, he's going to have more days off for weather than someone who's pursuing their training in one of the other aircraft. Uh, but it's just a fact of life with the LSAs. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's a Cessna issue. I think that's, a, that's an LSA issue. And you can read much more in the January edition of AOPA Pilot Magazine. It's part of our focus on the LSA industry. And that's it for this edition of AOPA Live this week. I'm Warren Morningstar, sitting in for Tom Haynes. We'll see you again next Thursday.